everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here in Lancaster with Randall, and uh, you're currently in the States, but you've been serving overseas. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you serving, and, and what does it look like on a typical day there? Great question. So uh, first of all, my name is Randall Graber, and married to Althea here from Lancaster County. We have one child, Alexander, who was just born December 7th, actually. So he's about six months old. And we serve in Lesbos, Greece. Uh, with Christian Aid Ministries there. Um, the program is the Re Refugee Discipleship Center is kind of hmm. the name of the program. We have been there about two and a half years now, since spring of 2018. So it's basically home at this point. Yeah, for us, for us it is mostly home. Um, we feel at home there, we really enjoy the work, enjoy the people, enjoy the culture. Beautiful place as well, that's a bonus. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we didn't sure. go to Greece <laughs> to, uh, you know, uh, go enjoy the scenery and the beautiful islands, but it is a bonus. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So what, like, what does it look like, like on a normal day? You know, how does your week start? Every day is often different. But for myself, my main responsibility with the work there is just kind of as the field administrator. You also have to understand there's only two families there, so it's pretty small. So okay. we do a lot of overlapping back and forth our responsibilities. But mostly I would be responsible for the accounting, the finances, the office work, any buildings we rent or own or any vehicles we have, maintenance, logistical stuff like that, mm -hmm. and also program uh, management and kind of overseeing. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we just have the one program there which Nathaniel Yoder, uh, who is currently there, uh, manages that. So you mentioned refugees, but we're talking about Greece here. So why, why are there refugees in Greece? T like, what's the story that caused them to, to arrive there? In every situation, the circumstances, are they change. They're different. Um, for the most part, refugees are fleeing war or poverty, governmental issues, oppression. Um, basically, you can kind of often uh, tell what they're fleeing from depending on which country they're from. Oh. Uh, we have refugees from all over, from Africa. Uh, most of them would be from the Middle East, and it also depends where at, on which island in Greece. Different islands have different uh, majority groups. Uh, the island we're on, Lesbos, is ma the majority would be from Afghanistan and Iran. Afghanistan. So how did they get all the way from Afghanistan to Greece? Most of them will either bring bus or walking um, across wow. the borders. That's a long walk. And <laughs> most of the stories, a lot of people I know that have told me their stories are often fleeing, especially the borders. The borders are very critical. They can normally bring like buses or public transportation up to borders. And then when it comes to actually crossing the border, they have to do that dark, after night, fleeing gunfire. There's a, there's a lot of uh, crazy stories you hear from the people yeah. um, crossing the borders. Um, but they would have to cross quite a few borders, and often they end up staying in Turkey as well for a while, for several years, before they eventually make it to uh, Lesbos there. Wow, so like on a map, where, where are we at here? So we, we, we have Greece, I know Turkey's right there, Mediterranean Sea, you're on an island, so where do you fit in? Yeah, so Lesbos is in a very strategic location, actually. It's like, a, it's, it's a natural bottleneck. It always has been a migration bottleneck, but it's, it's just off the coast of Turkey. Uh, the closest point is about five, six miles from Turkey. That's where the majority of the refugees make it across there on their rubber rafts. They also come along the whole western, eastern side of the island there against Turkey. Some places 12, 15 miles. As far as Lesbos in comparison to the rest of Europe, if you look at a map, you'd think it'd be Turkey. It's so close to Turkey. So the question would be then, why are serving Greece? Like, aren't there lots of other places along, I guess you could say, the refugee trail where these people are coming that might be more needy. Why did you choose Greece? There's kind of two questions there. Why serve in yeah. Greece and why, do, why did I serve in Greece? Yeah. Why did I choose to serve in Greece? Um, you know, as with many other things in life, there's not only one place where the need is exactly. So we personally felt uh, called to the work there through several events in our life that led us there. And especially Dean Taylor was very instrumental in getting us involved there. So okay. I yeah. believe a uh, mutual friend there. Yeah, we've interviewed him a number of times. Yeah, actually. yeah. yeah. Um, but it is a very intense place to work. Hmm. It's a very good place to go, at least for a short amount of time. I would recommend you to go, anyone to go. The experience you get is really life-changing for a lot of people. Just seeing these people, what they're fleeing from, 
and the situation that they're in, even in Lesbos, which is Europe, the situation is very bad as well. And so it really, it really, it pulls your heart uh, once you get there, you get involved, you start to know people. But there is many other places as well that have needs. So I'm not saying Greece is the only place. <laughs> there's needs everywhere. Um, in mainland Greece, there's lots of refugees, lots of needs. Uh, on through Europe. So if I'm understanding it right, you know, Lesbos is a pretty small island, yeah. so it's more of a transit, correct? It's like refugees are coming, but after a while we get full. So they are at some point hopefully get to mainland Greece or the rest of Europe. Is, is yes. that right? Yes, um, that, that, is, that is true. The past couple years, the new arrivals have been trending down. Generally speaking, uh, the new arrivals have been coming down, but the people leaving the island and the people leaving Greece have decreased. In a lot of ways, the refugees are kind of stuck there, unfortunately, wow. and especially the political situation. It seems like the, the, the political situation has swung a little bit right, more right-wing uh, across the whole EU, really. Anymore, it makes the news if one country accepts 20 refugees from Greece, it makes the national headlines. Uh, wow. Whereas back in 2015, you know, thousands and even millions of refugees were being accepted into the other countries. So that has wow. also played into the dynamics why there's still so many refugees there in Greece. And the numbers on Lesbos Island are as high or higher than they've ever been. Wow, so they're like just crunching them in because yeah. it's not, so you still have people coming, maybe less than mm -hmm. usual, but they're still coming, but there's not as many going to their actual destination exactly. country. Exactly. There is uh, currently, as we speak, there in Moria camp. I don't know the official number, but often most people I'm hearing say around 20,000. Mm. And then there's a few other smaller refugee camps on the island as well. So put it in perspective, Lesbos Island, they say has 90,000 Greek people on it. And Mytilene, the capital, has 30,000. And so in one refugee camp, Moria camp, there's 20,000 refugees, Whoa. to put it in perspective. Well, that, that would be really taxing on, on the rest, like the local population. It is. Well, it so is. that kind of transitions to the next point then too, because how, so you're there to serve these people, these refugees in a de desperate situation. They need help, granted. Yep. But how do we do that without neglecting the local populace as well, the, the Grecian people? You know, that is an excellent question, one that we grapple with daily or weekly there on the ground. I, I think the biggest thing you can do is just have that mindset as well that we're here to help the locals as well. And they are the host, they are the host people actually. You are living in their houses, their property, their land. Uh, over the years they've, they initially were very welcoming, very friendly, but the last couple years they have been actually fairly hostile towards the refugees, towards foreigners. So we're always looking for creative ways to help them out as well. In fact, the, the, the last couple of weeks because of the coronavirus situation, um, we actually converted our refugee center into a mask factory. Um, wow. And we were making masks for the Greek people, the police, the firefighters. So that was kind of a way that we could give out. I feel like we made more connections and built more bridges probably in the last two months than we did the year prior, just wow. doing refugee ministry as far as mm -hmm. with the local people. So that has been a big blessing. So it's like there, there's a balance there. You know, you're serving the refugees, but you're not, mm -hmm. you're not ignoring the locals because, yep. I mean, it is their island, I guess, exactly. after all. And I mean, it makes sense. You know, if you have a refugee camp that's almost as big as your entire capital city, yeah. that would be a little unnerving, I would think. Yeah, there's a lot of fear. They, they have really? a lot of wow. fear, and there's a lot of crime as well. I mean, they, honestly, I, without Jesus in a person's heart, this is, this is the result you have. You have fear and these issues, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, a Greek person shot a refugee with a shotgun mm. in the back. I mean, it was far enough away that it didn't kill the man, fortunately, but it was it was pretty serious. Um, but it was there again. It was because these refugees had stolen, I think, four or five times previously on, off of this guy's property. They stole some sheep, stole some things. Oh, wow. And so th the police force is just not very adequate to manage the crime rates, especially after dark. And in fact, our refugee center there, we've probably had six to eight break-ins over really? a course of several months. Like, are we talking, you know, they're, they're having uh, difficulty getting access to even just the most basic things, you know, um, food, shelter, clothes, that type of thing, and that's causing these levels of desperation? That's a good question. I wouldn't say the level of desperation really is any worse. Hmm. Uh, than it was previously, but the level of life uh, that the refugees get is very, very low. Uh, you'd think Europe, they would at least have decent accommodations, but they really don't. Moria Camp is, uh, I think it's about 
12, 15 acres, and there's 20,000 people on it, so it's very densely populated. Whoa. And about three-fourths of them live in tents, I would guess. A lot of these are also just structures built from pallets. They'll put tarps over them. The bathroom facilities, I think they say it's several hundred refugees for every toilet. So the sanitary conditions are very, very poor. Um, they do get meals as far as food. Uh, they do provide food for them. They, they do get provided basic food and basic shelter, but the standard is, is very low, unfortunately. But looking beyond, I, I think one, and one of our biggest uh, visions for our work there is, is not so much the humanitarian aid aspect as they do have basics provided. Uh, the standard is very, very low, and it's unfortunate. And we do uh, offer, we do try to, when there's special situations, special needs, to help out in the humanitarian aid stand or in the that part of it. But our main focus is more for their spiritual health, their well-being. Mm -hmm. It's it's such an opportunity when people get everything taken away from them. They fled home. They fled everything. They have nothing left. Their hearts are left asking questions. Their hearts are very open. And it has been a tremendous opportunity for um, God's word there. And people are very open. They're thirsty. Um, really nowhere else have I seen it with Muslim people, the hunger and thirst. So that's kind of, it feels like what we're trying to uh, provide and kind of capital, or not uh, to focus on. Mm -hmm as it feels like that is really the most eternal impact we can have yeah. with these refugees. It really works the best when you can do both. Not really focusing on one or the other, but if they see that you genuinely care for them, you're helping them, and you're also showing them the salvation message, Jesus' teachings, they are very, uh, a lot more receptive. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the, the love that radiates from your life, they, they, they see it. So like those that are watching this, What's some way that they can get involved if they want to help? There are several organizations. If you want to get involved in Greece, um, there are several organizations that bring volunteers over. We do more long-term oriented stuff. We don't do short-term volunteers. One of the biggest ways you can get involved is pray. Th th there's many ways to be involved, really. So with your time there in, in Greece, uh, what is one thing you've learned from your refugee friends? The first thing that comes to my mind that I have learned is being content, it's, it's interesting. It's maybe not the first thing that would come to your mind when you think of uh, difficult situations and hardly the, the, the bare necessities of life are provided, but yet I have seen it time and time again in these refugees' lives, especially the Christian refugees. You know, they have so little, but yet they're content. They're happy with where they are. It has really challenged me as an American with all the blessings we have as Americans to be content and to use our material uh, blessings. There's many blessings that come with being American. Using these to assist these refugees, to benefit them in ways that we can, and most, most of all benefiting God's kingdom, building his kingdom. Um, but that is probably one of the biggest things for me, just being content with, uh, with life. So following that up then, what is one story uh, of a refugee say that you find is is fairly typical of what these people have been through that kind of takes all we've talked about sums it up into one package what's the story you could share with us to, to close this out i have many stories running through my head and it feels <laughs> like the names the details kind of all uh blur together and i'm i'm not a very detailed person so i'll do my <laughs> i'll do my best uh recollecting the details i do have one man in mind actually and i'll change his name we'll call him ali um, this is not his real name but he was from Iran in his 30s, and he had gone to uh, school, went to college. He was a professional uh, engineer. So he, he had a very well-paying job, and he was very respected. His situation, the political pressures there in Iran are very difficult. If you don't really agree with what the government wants you to support and be a part of, you'll end up in jail you can very easily. So there's a lot of uh, political refugees. He would be what I would consider a political refugee just because of the political situation there. So he just decided it was better off for him and his future to flee. Um, he entrusted all of his money, his bank accounts to one of his friends. He said, hey, when I get to Greece or wherever I'm going to Europe, you know, you can, you can, you have power of attorney, you can send it to me. And he was very well to do. 
Um, but he, after quite a few years, I don't remember exactly how long, he made it to Turkey. He met a friend there who, was bring, who brought him to church. That's kind of where he was first introduced to Christianity. And it kind of pricked his uh, interest a little bit. He didn't give his life to Christ then. Also, uh, while he was in Turkey, his friend back in Iran that he had entrusted all of his wealth to his bank accounts, he essentially transferred everything to his name and just disappeared. Oh. Oh. And so he was dealing with a lot of bitterness. What do you do? He can't go back. He, he needed to go forward. So he dealt with a lot of difficult things in his life. Through this situation, he actually kind of discovered the freedom of forgiveness. He had okay. never really wow. been introduced to Christianity and what Jesus teaches about forgiveness, but he was kind of introduced to it, uh, or it, he, he discovered the freedom of forgiveness because he was so bitter for so long, he's like, you know, I have to give it up. Yeah. And then when he came to Lesvos, Greece, he came to the facility there, to the discipleship center. He spoke some English as well, so we got to know him very well. He eventually kept coming, built a relationship, was coming to church, coming to class, and he gave his life to Christ. We baptized him there uh, on Lesbos, and he's still there, and a very active member in the church and wow. the group there. And it was just really special, uh, the, the part of his story where he discovered forgiveness, and then when he became a Christian, he was like, oh, this makes so much sense, because here's yeah. Jesus in the Bible talking about forgiveness, and he had never never heard these teachings before, so wow. it really connected with him. It was really interesting. There's many refugees, many other stories fleeing a lot of hardships. A lot of refugees flee war-torn areas, family members killed, blown up, uh, a lot of difficulties, especially Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq. We don't deal as much with the Syrian and Iraqi refugees. There's not a whole lot of them on Lesbos. So, lots of needs, a lot yes. of opportunities, yes. a lot so of things much. to pray about, I guess. Yes. Wow. Wow. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to share. I really appreciate this and blessings in your work. Absolutely. Um, Thank you, Regan. Yeah. It was yeah. a pleasure. Yeah. Okay.